It was like 12 hours of just, I mean, at the time, it was absolute hell. That's Courtney Barber. But then looking back on it, it was one of the greatest days that I've ever had in my lifetime. I want to start this episode talking to Courtney because she represents everything that there is to love about the Bronco. For some reason, I like those those moments where you don't know if you're going to make it and you have no choice to just keep going. Like, I guess those are the moments I live for. Oh, and she loves to drive. A few years back, Courtney was looking for the drive of a lifetime. My thing is doing something that people have told me I can't. The minute someone tells me I can't, I accept that challenge and say, let's do it. I live on Folly Beach and I live on the ocean. So my, I just, I love oceans. I love the smell of it. I love the sight of it. I love all of it. So she decided to drive from the Atlantic Ocean to the Arctic Ocean. A new piece of road had just opened up. It's a part of the Dempster Highway, but it's not much of a road at all. It's just a single lane of dirt. Really a line on the map. And it cuts through the heart of the Canadian Arctic all the way to the ocean. At the end of the road is the tiny fishing village of Tuktoyaktuk. So I knew I needed something big and something that would be able to do, you know, extreme situations. So what do you think she bought? Yeah, good guess. A Bronco. A 1978 model. One of the big ones. I've always loved the front grille of it. It's just big and beastly. I wanted something that could kind of be my more macho side, and that's why I got my Bronco. It's the original blue color, but then I wanted to add the freewheeling package to it. That's a yellow and orange stripe that runs from the roof down to the B pillar, which is right behind the driver's seat, and then to the back of the bed. I wanted it to look like a sunrise off the water, and it's just happy. I guess that's how I describe my paint scheme, just happy. The trip she was preparing for was epic, more than 9,000 miles. Most of it would be on paved highways, though, but the final stretch would be fully off-road. She needed a Bronco to handle both. So I ended up doing a complete overhaul on it, changed the engine, changed the transmission. So now I have overdrive and a 408 stroker, stroked out 351 Windsor, so it gets me better gas mileage. And with that, she was off. Charleston, South Carolina, actually is where I left and just started heading north. My plan each day was just to put it into the GPS on my phone and go where it told me to go. I really tried not to do much more planning than that. I just hate to be rushed. It's like my number one pet peeve in the world. I just like to drive along, cruise along, and get places. It was easy cruising until she reached in Newvik. We hit the Dempster Highway, and they had warned us about, you know, needing two or three spare tires and be careful of your windshield and all these problems. And, you know, we had to go pretty slow, but we got up to around 20 to 30 miles an hour, you know, even 40 at times. We saw a grizzly bear. We saw moose and mama moose just pass right in front of the truck. Then at the end of the Dempster Highway was the beautiful blue of the Arctic Ocean. It was absolutely gorgeous. 5,000 miles, no breakdowns, no flat tires. She didn't even get lost. I was just like, wow, I'm like, you know, this is what everyone warned us about. You know, this really wasn't that difficult. People had told her it couldn't be done, but there she was literally and figuratively, on top of the world. And then it rained. And not just a little bit. On the way back, it was rainy, which changes everything. Oh my God, it changed everything. Life is like that sometimes. Right when you think all your plans are working out perfectly, it rains. This is Bring Back Bronco, the untold story. I'm Sonarian Glinton. We're retelling the history of the Bronco with one driving question. Is there enough passion, enough love outside and inside of Ford to bring it back? Courtney Barber is a good example of that passion. Before the rains, Courtney was on top of the world. She and her Bronco had done what everyone else had said was impossible. 
And that's the way the Bronco fans, both inside and outside of Ford, were feeling at the Detroit Auto Show in 2004. The Bronco had been out of production for eight years, but now Ford had this shiny silver concept version. It was solid proof that the Bronco was on its way back, or so they thought. Welcome to Chapter 6, Stuck in the Mud. Revealing that concept was a huge moment. Longtime fans and fresh-faced first-timers were enthralled. The problem is, in the months that followed, nothing happened. The concept was hidden from public view, and Ford never gave any updates on the project. So why show it but then never build it? Well, that's what I wanted to find out. My first stop is the Bronco Underground, the unofficial gang of Ford employees scheming to bring back the Bronco. How, how, did, how did this so-called underground get started at the company? Well, there was a planning project of just how many SUVs should we have at the Ford Motor Company on the Ford brand. And, and at the time there were how many? There were three, Escape, Explorer, and Expedition. We all kind of looked at each other and said, oh, this is the time, let's bring it back. And it. Is. Being Bronco. Yeah, bring it back. I'm sitting with Tom Patterson, a key member of the Bronco Underground. I picked Ford right out of school. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. I, I think I marked 32 years at the end of this year. Oh, congratulations. With Ford, so yeah. Tom's an older dude, short, cropped, gray hair. He's short and full of energy. You figure out pretty quick he's probably smarter than you are, but he does this self-deprecating, aw shucks routine just to make you feel at ease. Now, in 2004, they, you, the Ford puts out a concept of you roll your eyes and, and like an exasperation for somebody who's been trying to get a project <laughs> on the road for many. Nothing happened. We just showed the concept. How did that feel? I mean, like, because there's a big, and this is days of big auto shows, by the way. Right, yeah, yeah. Down. What Tom and I are talking about is that watershed moment the now infamous Bronco concept car. It actually made a reappearance a few years ago, showing up in the movie Rampage with Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Now, don't worry if you didn't see it. The movie, much like the concept car, was all sizzle, no steak. I think there's, there's different reasons for doing concept cars. That's Maury Callum, the chief designer. Sometimes it's to tease the public about what we know is coming. Sometimes it's to test the public about what could be coming. Sometimes it's really just a, a, a you know, from a design viewpoint, we're trying to we're trying to get some feedback on a design language or a, or a or a form of the vehicle that this new. In the Bronco specifically, I think it was a case of you know, let, let's let's try and gauge some interest in terms of do people is there really still a want for a, a true Bronco? Mark Gruber, another Bronco Underground member, says. It gives you an insight into how the Bronco Underground really operated. Despite being one of the driving members, he actually had nothing to do with it. It wasn't really marketing driven at that point. Other people, uh, kind of, you know, probably honorary Bronco Underground type members where they're just like, hey, we want to bring this back. What can we do? Let's develop a concept vehicle and people will go crazy and then maybe it'll turn into uh, an actual production vehicle. The challenge on that one was it really was, it was strictly a concept. It wasn't really developed to go put that into production. So even though there was a lot of support and excitement about it, there was nothing Ford really could easily do at that point. They had once again answered the marketing question, will people buy it? But come up short on the production question, how are we going to build it? It was around this time that a new member joined the underground. Chris Ring. With him on board, they set out on attempt number three. Because, hey, third time's the charm, right? I can't say for certain that Chris Ring was the quarterback of his high school football team and that he dated the head cheerleader, but it wouldn't surprise me. Now, for the underground, he has another quality that is way more important than his looks. In fact, Chris is uniquely qualified to answer the question how can we build this thing? 
I was the, uh, the vehicle planning manager uh, for body on frame vehicles back in the 04 through early 07 timeframe. We probably need a quick explainer here. There are two ways to build the vehicle. There's unibody. If you drive a passenger car, it's probably a unibody. The frame and the body are all of one piece. But body on frame means building separate pieces. That two-part approach is more rugged. And Chris Ring is the planning manager for exactly those kinds of trucks. I was chatting with just my team, and we said, you know, we, we, we got to come up with a Bronco. Let's work on a Bronco. But let's keep it quiet for a while. Let's do a skunk works uh, until we know we have a viable business proposition. Then we'll get all the help we need. The first thing Chris did was put a new spin on the excitement created by the concept car. So we knew at the time the company was really concerned about products for millennials, right? We said, we don't really have anything for millennials. We wonder if we can use this angle to get this, you know, some excitement in the company about doing a Bronco. And what we knew was in 2004, there was uh, a great concept that was introduced at the, 20, or at the, the uh, North American International Auto Show. And it resonated like crazy with millennials. We said, great, that's a hook we can use. Then they dug into the details. And so we had uh, somebody from the design studio actually find the data for that auto show property. And we stretched it over what we called the T6 platform, which was a platform that was being used for the Ranger and the Everest SUV outside of North America. And it was just being developed. And it was a perfect fit. And then we did the package work, you know, the engineering around, you know, what the occupant uh, space looked like and, and all of that. And it, things really were falling together. Now, those engineering particulars are not trivial matters. An efficient production plan, in this case, one that piggybacks on another product, is crucial if you're going to make money in the car business. We actually ended up, I remember, in the basement of the design center with the vice president of design at the time. And we went through the proposal and he said, oh, this is a no brainer. We've, we've just got to do it. All this took a year. It was now 2006, but still Chris wasn't ready to take his millennial Bronco public. He wanted to stay under the radar for a little while longer. And the reason was that the minute you get something sanctioned to go work on, you got a lot of reviews with a lot of people and it can slow things down. Time was becoming their enemy. The T6 platform they hoped to use was in its final design stage. They needed to stake their claim before someone else did. At the time, they were developing manufacturing facilities in Venezuela and in South Africa um, for the Ranger and the Everest. They had extra manufacturing capacity and they had uh, gotten wind of a conversation I had with one of the vehicle line directors and said, hey, we have extra capacity. We're wondering if you could use it because it would really help, you know, spread our fixed costs and, and help the overall business case. I said, yep, we'll take it. Chris drew up a production plan that called for 63,000 Broncos to be built in the first year alone. That was about double what the Bronco was selling in the early 90s. We were moving fast. We had the design studio, we had advanced product marketing, we had product marketing, product planning, finance, uh, and what we called at the time our basic design group, which is just advanced engineering. All of those groups involved meeting uh, you know, multiple times a week and doing work really fast to prove this out. That's a lot of resources to wrangle when you aren't even really officially a thing. Now, if we had been working on you know, a, an ice cream truck, I think those, uh, those meetings, we might have had trouble getting people coming, but, uh, but this was the Bronco. You know, every time we said Bronco or brought up Bronco as a, a meeting subject, ears perked up. Anybody we needed as inputters, you know, from their critical activity, we got them. Listening to Chris talk about everything they were doing, a little question keeps bouncing around in the back of my head. Were they really that good at keeping a secret, or did the suits in the C-suite know what they were doing? That's a question I put to Jim Farley. Remember Jim? 
Back in chapter three, he was standing at the side of the highway as OJ's white Bronco drove past. Well, now he's Ford Motor Company's CEO. My grandfather started here in 1913 and the 389th employee, he was an orphan. He started here in the year that Henry invented the assembly line. He was 14 when he joined the company. He goes, I remember when they installed the assembly line thing. I used to make the whole car, then I started only making wheels. And we go to the Rouge where he worked. And he said, I need you to go to college. We owe everything in our family to Ford Motor Company. None of us would have gone to college without it. One thing he learned in college is what to do when your employees start developing projects on the side. Nothing better than a small group of people working on something. Nothing makes me happier than someone to say, hey, Jim, we've been working on on the side on this one. I knew it's going to be pretty good. You know, uh, the GT came from that. The original Mustang came from that. You know, that's when Ford's at our best. All this is great news for the underground. Execs were aware of their work. And although it was never officially endorsed, it wasn't expressly forbidden either. Everyone was willing to indulge their little passion project to a point. Then it's got to pass a business case and it's got to be on brand. We got lots of ideas, you know, hey, we got to, you know, this or that new idea, but um, it's, that's not enough. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Necessary, but not sufficient. That's Jim Farley's answer to the question. If you love something enough, can you bring it back to life? His response is, maybe. So you damn well better make sure you got a good business plan on the table. The Millennial Bronco Project was in great shape. They had a large growing demographic defined. They had a production plan that was efficient and profitable. Now all they needed was someone in the C-suite, a high-ranking exec, to lead them through the incredible procedural obstacle course on their way to approval. So we got to a point where we were ready to review the proposal with sort of the senior management of product planning. We had uh, the investment. We had negotiated manufacturing capacity. All the things you would normally have to prove you have a viable business proposition to be added to the cycle plan. The cycle plan is the master document that lists all of Ford's products. It details how many of each vehicle will get produced each year. It lists what factory will build them and for how long. Now, if you're in the cycle plan, you are a real thing. If you're not, you're just an idea in the wilderness. So the head of product planning at the time was a, a guy by the name of Ed Ostrowski. He was our last hurdle within our organization before we would then take it to um, a higher level for potential inclusion into the cycle plan. And if you can get past Ed, then there's got to be something to the proposal. So we sat with him, we had our uh, presentation, and he peppered us. And we had an answer for everything. Chris showed me the white three-wing binder he took to the meeting. It's about three inches thick, and written on the spine in black Sharpie, it says, Millennial Bronco. Inside, there are design drawings, manufacturing specifications, cost estimates for individual parts, and a marketing strategy. Uh, you know, we even... Uh, thought a, a little bit ahead what, what would uh what would a derivative look like so we did we uh, we laid out a truck we laid out a four-door um to have plans for the future at Ostrowski went through every single page uh we finally got to the end and he looked almost tired like uh you know he he, he gave uh, every question he could possibly think of and and we we uh, we really had it down Having the head of product planning sign off on your idea is the golden stamp of approval. The only thing left was the christening. That would happen at the meeting of the vice presidents. So that would have been around the early 07 timeframe. So with about a four or five year horizon to develop it, we'd be looking at 2011 or 2012. So yeah, we were, we were on cloud nine, uh, which you know quickly turned to a dark rainy cloud when we found out uh, we weren't gonna have that opportunity. <laughs> You see, something happened between the presentation in Ed's office and the meeting of the vice presidents. The Millennial Bronco Project never got there. It wasn't even put on the agenda. And uh, 
there was uh, a particular executive and uh, I guess, you know, a corporate, uh, a lack of corporate appetite at the time to, uh, to allocate the monies for this project. A particular executive. Now, Chris has never officially been told who vetoed the project. And if he does know who it was, he ain't saying. We were disappointed because, uh, especially on this, because there was so much enthusiasm. Of course, there are many sides to every story, and it's undeniable there were some considerable external forces at play. The stock market suffered one of its worst days in years Monday. On September 15, 2008, what we now call the subprime mortgage collapse began. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost more than 4%, plummeting 504 points to settle at 10,915. Billions of dollars disappeared from the economy overnight. Monday's plunge was the sixth largest point drop ever. That started a domino effect impacting every industry in the country, including, in a big way, car sales. The American people are concerned about the situation in our financial markets and our economy, and I share their concerns. Now, just to be clear of the sequence of events here, the millennial Bronco was shot down a number of months before the collapse, but the winds of the recession were already blowing strong. Ford, like all manufacturers, were shoring up their position and making sure they weren't overextended. Because we'd be looking ahead at how much money we would be wanting to spend, both in capital investment and engineering resources, people. Um, I obviously wouldn't have the purview, but folks at the higher level would know what our plans were. Um, we would be needing to conserve some cash, uh, maybe not do as much hiring as we would like. And so, um, you know, resource constraints, capital constraints, um, they, they came into play, unfortunately, at that time. Any chance of reviving it died the next year. The big three, Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler, were all hovering on bankruptcy. That's Bailey Sasoy Moore, my Detroit history expert. The federal government has taken extraordinary measures to address the challenges confronting our financial markets. Literally, the federal government under President Bush has to come in and bail out the auto industry because they recognize that if auto goes down, Michigan goes down. As our recent actions demonstrate, my administration is focused on meeting these challenges. Both General Motors and Chrysler accepted the government-funded bailout packages Ford did not. It's a time Jim Farley remembers very well. When we didn't get the bailout, when we worked ourselves to save our own company, we knew not only we were running a great business, but we took tremendous pride in that moment. But with all that internal belt tightening and with the entire industry in a tailspin, launching a new Bronco was not even worth discussing. That began a long, dark period, six years, where the fabled Bronco Underground could get no traction. I think Chris Ring's millennial Bronco proposal is the closest Bronco ever came to resurrection. He had the market clearly defined, he had a production plan that would have been profitable, and he had executive support. Well, right up until he didn't. It's kind of like Courtney Barber, who thought driving to the shore of the Arctic Ocean and back was easy, until it wasn't. On the way back, it was rainy, which changes everything. Every about 20 minutes, we had to get out and just start dumping water on the windshield because it was just covered in mud. You were fishtailing all over the place. Trucks were actually few. We saw two that had gone off the cliff because that's the thing. This road is real narrow, and it's just... The mud turned into this, like, slick, just quicksand. So you'd get going down a hill, and then you'd have to go back up, you know, the other side. And if you got going too fast, things got a little squirrely. But if you didn't go fast enough, you wouldn't make it back up the other side of the hill. And it was just absolutely crazy. The nice, easy ride from the day before we had done in about four hours, it took us about 16 that's 16 hours to get to the first safe spot to stop for the night. A week and a half later, she was safe and sound back in South Carolina. The 
The Bronco Underground drove through quite a few thunderstorms of their own as they worked to bring back the Bronco. But if you love something enough, and if you're patient enough, you can bring it back to life. And so my first question was, can we do anything on the second vehicle? And he said, yep, anything. I said, we can do a Bronco. That is next on Bring Back Bronco, the untold story. I'm Sinari Glenton. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen. <laughs>